Let me see. Yes, they're good. Okay. All right, everyone. We are doing esthetician chat this morning with Angela Green. We are going to kind of do a little bit of a different chat today. We're really going to take and talk about our business. And really, now that we're here, what do we do moving forward? Because a lot of us don't know where we need to be. So Angela, if you don't know, is Director of Education for Say Brazil Wax. She's in charge of our educators. She's in a vital team member of the Smooth Skin Supply family. She also has her master's degree. She also has a wide range of work with human resources. So that is her, uh, I would say not even main, I think it's the same amount of time you've done HR work that you've done aesthetics or no, is HR longer? HR is longer now. Yes. Now. So I've been with HR for close to 30 years total time. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Yeah. Took a, a beautiful detour to owning my own business. And that's how I landed in the spy industry. And actually, for those who you know, know the story, I'm going to give a little brief synopsis. My mother did hair. So with that, I always grew up in the beauty industry, um, was with her as she started her own business from behind the chair, watched her do a lot of things really, really well, watched her do a lot of things not so well. So when I got to, um, through about 20 or so years of human resources, I thought, God, there's got to be more to life than this. Um, took some time out, um, started my family, you know, had Derek and all those things and all that came together with uh, being in the spa business. I knew I wanted to do something beauty related, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. Um, my first license in California was actually as a manicure since I just love getting my nails done. Thought, well, I'll just start there with something I love and move on from there. But from that um, landed uh, the incredible opportunity to own the day spa in Oakland. It was an add on Craigslist and it just, it chose me. So. From that point, realized the demand for skincare services, became licensed as an esthetician. Not long after that, met you through uh, doing, you know, you were my, my sales rep at the time. Yes. But yes, we quickly became friends and have had this journey since that time. But um, one of the key factors I want to mention is that I've um, continued my work in human resources pretty much on a contract basis. So it gives me the flexibility to still do something I love. And that is the detour or pivot that some people may need to take. Um, for me, as an esthetician, I am always going to be an esthetician. There's just no question, no clue about that. And so I've, you know, uniquely and very creatively pushed my skills to set together to contribute in aesthetics in the way that I, I have and that I can, and I think it's been pretty effective. But to me, the, it's been a while since we did, you know, since our Periscope days, since we've done a live like this, but for me, I want to really speak from the employment perspective, um, more of, of knowing where your status is at this particular time. Um, this particular time is so unique, um, so critical. Uh, you and I survived and went through the process of the yes, recession. We did. 2007, 2008. And the question I kept asking myself is, why am I having to go through this? And the answer that came to me ultimately was because you need to teach. Mm -hmm. And here we are. And we've been doing that all this time. Um, but here we are in, uh, again, nothing like this has ever happened before. So I can't, I feel, I don't feel right even comparing the two, but there were definitely some lessons learned from that recession that can definitely be applied to what's happening now. Absolutely. So, the message is really know what your current status is. Are you an employee or are you a small business owner? And we really, we really need to hash that out. We do. And I think a lot of people are really confused really with the unemployment. So can you really go and explain? Because there's a lot of people who don't, they think it's going to fall back onto their employer or the previous job they have, not realizing that it's you pay into it. Exactly. So, so as an employee, um, you, there are certain characteristics being an employee. I think at some point in our you know, lives, we've all been an employee or at least know someone who was employed. So what are the characteristics of being an employee? Uh, you typically apply for a job, you interview for that job, you get hired, you fill in an I-9 to establish legal, legal authorization to work in the U.S., um, you um, fill in a W-2, which then becomes a W-4 um, once you, around tax time, and that's due to you every um, January by January 31st. Um, you report at a certain time, you leave at a certain time, or you receive overtime. Um, if you look at, you receive a pay stub of your, for your hours or wages, you're classified as exempt or non-exempt. So there's certain characteristics that you experience on a day-to-day 
um, being an employee. So we know what it is to be an employee. And if you don't know, these are the things that constitute you being an employee of a business. Um, with that, if you look at your paycheck stub, there are taxes taken out. And a lot of times we don't take the time to look at those paycheck stubs to understand exactly where our money is going. One of the lines on there will say UI, which stands for unemployment insurance. And that is the fund that you pay into as an employee of a business so that when these times come and you have to draw from that, that is where the unemployment is drawn from. It's not something your employer pays into. They're paying into your safety through workers' compensation insurance. They're paying payroll taxes. Um, part of what you earn is a write-off for them. But again, employers have a different set of liability and employees have a different set of responsibilities. Now with your um, paycheck stub, uh, you'll see things like SSI, your federal taxes, your state taxes, which all go, go towards certain uh, resources. But in this case, unemployment insurance is something that you pay into as an employee. Yes. And, that and that's the difference, right? So we see a lot of estheticians who are sole props who don't do payroll, which is why we, you and I both, ever since we've been together, have always talked about payroll, even if you're paying for it because of the fact that you're paying into unemployment, you're paying into disability, you're paying as an employee. So as a sole prop, even when I had my book, that was kind of my turnaround when I talked about my book and paying yourself was that you actually became an employee for those things. Because here's the thing about payroll and why unemployment is so difficult right now, especially for sole proprietors who are estheticians, because we don't understand the importance of payroll. So now that we're here and moving forward, that should definitely be on everyone's list is to actually put themselves on payroll, even if you are a sole proprietor, even if you take a draw. Because in the beginning, when I was paying myself, I did not have a salary, meaning I may have done payroll on paper, maybe once a month, even as a draw, just to show that I was contributing to unemployment and my disability and social security, which is really where everything is coming from now and why it's so frustrating for sole proprietors is because, you know, and I remember when I was working, it was really, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul. I was really working just to be able to have the business open. Once I became profitable, I didn't really think about putting into payroll into action because it wasn't something that was ever discussed. We don't discuss this in our industry. We don't talk about payroll. We really only kind of save that for salon owners or business owners or spa owners. We don't talk about it as a sole prop. And that's something that I had to learn really early on as I started increasing my revenue is like, so where is the money going? You know, and that's something that I think we don't really talk about. And I know that with your background with human resources, you're seeing a lot of people kind of be in panic mode. Um, so for the businesses that you are already working with, especially estheticians, what are you giving them to do now that we're here? What are you giving them to do like as far as a checklist for when things do come back to our new normal? What are you giving them checklists to do? Like what's the first thing that someone's to do outside of starting payroll or getting with the payroll company? Right. Well, first of all, know your status. Um, again, there are a lot of uh, estheticians that we find in that gray area as sole proprietors and not really sure what to do. Um, and am I an independent contractor? Am I a business owner? I'm a business owner, but am I really? Um, know where you are today or uh, where you've been, where you are today, um, because that's going to determine what benefits you qualify for if you're going to stay in business. Um, what's happening with a lot of these big companies, people are complaining about the delays. And they're having to go through so many people that don't know what their status is. So if there's going to be delays as long as people are calling, sole proprietors are calling unemployment with no unemployment insurance they paid into. And you've got sole proprietors that have not established themselves as a true business that are calling SBA, but you have no business, you have no bank account. So it's causing a backlog for those who know what their status is and that are plugging into the right resources. So first things first, know your status. If you are an employee, then unemployment is the route you're going to take. If you are anything other than an employee, or if you are a small business owner, you have an established banking account. You have, um, say, a CPA or accountant. Your taxes have been filed. Um, you have um, a 
corporate status, you have a legal status, you have insurance on your business, you know that you are a small business owner, then of course the SBA programs are going to be the way to go. But if you find yourself in that limbo, in that gray area, you have really got to make some decisions about your livelihood. And the first things first, if you're not willing to sit down with yourself and create a budget, I'm going to say this very harshly, you're just not ready. Yeah. You've got to secure yourself. We are in the business of service to other people, whether it be through the actual services we provide, selling of retail, our consultations, all the things that's shifting in our business. But if you're not willing to do a budget, what money can I make? What money do I need to spend to sustain myself, to do basic things, to have a roof over my head, to eat, to feel secure? Then you apply those same principles once you master those into your business. So I do have a weekly productivity worksheet that I have been using with a number of people that I coached before. It's very business specific to skincare and aesthetics. I'm offering that. I've taken the price off of it, offering that for free on my um, teachable platform. So if you go to Skin Biz School on Facebook or Instagram, you can click the link there and we'll maybe add it in after this, um, after we're done here. And it's a free worksheet and it's very specific to what money is coming in what money is going out. And then there's a second tab that will determine what your budget is from a week to week basis. You have to be willing to build the ha good habits in order to sustain them. Um, we've, in our one-on-one -on -one conversations, I've consistently said, your level of preparation to this point is gonna determine your level of recovery. If you weren't prepared as a business owner, it's gonna be very difficult, if possible, to recover as a business owner. So yeah. you may have to take that detour for a period of time until you can really secure yourself and your family, and then secure your business. That's one thing that I think I've seen a lot of estheticians are very fearful with talking to landlords or even letting go of their rental spaces. And I'm not quite understanding why there's such a big fear, um, especially if you're not able to afford it. And I have been, especially with my mentoring group, um, you and I have talked to our educators and we've really been encouraging them to, if you can't afford it, it's okay to give notice because guess what? There's other people giving notice. And when this changes, then you can go back and have a conversation. And it may be at a different location. It may be at the same location. But there's, a, there's definitely a wide gap of people being afraid of letting their rental go when they can't afford it. And that's something that I've been very honest with, with a lot of estheticians who've reached out to me, and I know you have as well. You're going to have to really make some tough decisions, but those decisions have to be based off of your home and not the business, which is secondary. If you let go of the rental, that is okay. You're not currently seeing people there. No one's going to that business. So you are paying for something that you're not utilizing. It's okay in your budget to cross it off for a moment of time and then come back to it. And I know that you have really broken down the whole rental understanding how the rental market is. You and I have both have been into the rental market for a while. We know how the game works. Um, the 30 day notice thing for me has always been very interesting because I'm seeing landlords, either they're not wanting to willing to work with their tenants. Mm -hmm. Some are willing to forgive all the way. And then some are willing to take something over nothing. Um, how do you tell people to really have that conversation? Like what's the first thing? Cause I know <laughs> if not telling your business too much, but you and I have both have let go of, of leases before, before the leases yeah. have been up. So we've been through that process. Um, what, what was your, uh, and then yours definitely is a little bit more unique than mine because you had two locations that you let go. At I had one two time. locations at the same time. I was actually in the middle of an expansion during the, um, the mortgage recession, mortgage prices and subsequent recession. So I had a plan. I was a business owner. I had an S Corp. I had all the things in place and it still hit hard, very yes, hard. It did. Um, I was in the process of relocating and um, got into a, a lease agreement and I had a broker. Again, I was checking the boxes, doing all the things right. That broker failed to put me into a space that was commercial ready. So here I am paying out rent for two spaces for a good three months. And at the third, at 90 days, I said, no more. I'm not going to be able to move forward with this. I have to cut it. And then things just continue to go downhill from there because I wasn't getting revenue I was previously getting, and I had to let it all go. I had to release it all. But again, the good news is that in releasing all of that, you know, and holding onto it so tight and releasing all of that, I've received so much more. Um, I received an opportunity to educate for some of the best brands in this business. I literally had markets handed to me. 
Um, I received the opportunity to work with you and the space and the time to do that. We've traveled internationally. I mean, so many more doors were open and not looking at that closed door. So the first thing I would say is give yourself a specific time frame. Is it 30 days? Is it 60 days? Is it 90 days? And base that off of reality. How much money do you have? If you don't have it, you can't sustain a business, let alone sustain yourself. So approach that landlord, make the phone call. If they won't answer, send a certified letter. There are tons of templates online. It can be very simple. I am tempted to contact you and left your voicemail on X date and time. And I am attempting to contact you to negotiate the terms of my lease. Uh, please contact me at, and again, give yourself very specific time frames. I would say in 30, no more than 90 day, uh, 30 day increments, but no more than 90 days on anything. Because at this point you cannot do treatments. And that's a harsh reality that we all have to accept. I agree. The, uh, the thing that I keep talking about is people keep telling their customers, I can't wait to see you. I know it's coming back. I miss you so much. And instead of focusing on that, and, and the date keeps moving farther away, because I keep saying everyone needs to prepare for July. And now they're saying August, so I may have to move that to August. But July is where I'm telling everyone to prepare to. But you have a lot of folks who either are very stuck, they're kind of in that fight or flight mode. They're either, you know, fighting the reality or they flight and they've gone off somewhere and they're like, okay, I can't handle this. You had a really good thing that you went over with um, our educators that you were saying that the stages of grief, um, because this pandemic for a lot of us is very much super emotional because we have been taken away. Um, everything was taken away so fast that we didn't really have a time to process. And this is almost, it is a grieving process. We've, we've lost the amount of freedom that we have had and the decisions that we're making. But share with us that you, when you shared with us with our group, your, uh, and I loved it, the stages that we go through. And, and then, you know, those of you who are watching, what stage are you at with this whole pandemic situation? So go ahead, Angela, because I love that. Yes, absolutely. So these are the stages of grief. Um, this is, uh, these are psychological terms, the things that psychologists use in their practices to help people through the grief process. We are mourning a way of life that we have all come to know, and there's no normal in any of this. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to look for different ways to communicate. Uh, you could be that beacon of light to that client who is, you know, saying, oh, I can't wait to see you again. Or if you're the one saying, I can't wait to see you again. You, we really have to learn how to shift those conversations into positives whenever we can. But the five stages of grief start with denial. And that's where a lot of these posts are starting. I can't wait to see you again. And the post of the, you know, touching the clients and all the videos and my heart goes out because you're in denial. Yes. That's not going to happen for quite some time. And when it does happen, it's going to look a lot different. Yep. And that's, again, there's other resources to talk about how that's going to look a little bit later. The second stage is anger. And yes, you have every right to be angry. Anger is a very natural emotion when it comes to something like this. All of what I've worked for, trust me, I've been there. All of what I've built, you're mad at yourself, you're mad at everybody, you're yeah. mad because they won't do and who did this to me? And it's natural to be angry, but we can't live in that. Um, we can't, certainly cannot thrive in that. So first denial, second is anger, third is bargaining. Trying to figure out how we can make it work. Well, if that person did it, and maybe I can send a text to just my real tight circle of clients. And here in California, they're cutting your water off. So you may go back to your space with no water, no electricity. Bargaining. We cannot bargain our way out of this. It's so much healthier to accept things for what they are. Fourth to that is depression. It's the not wanting to get out of bed in the morning and, you know, the, the poor eating habits consistently that you just can't seem to break, the sugar cravings, um, all the things that put us, that keep us in a depressive state. Uh, get up. It, if you cannot shift your mindset, at least move your body around. Go outside. You, you can go outside. Yes, you can okay? go outside. You can go outside. You can go for a brief walk. Shift your body in some way. And when you come back, you may have a different perspective on things. And finally, you have acceptance. You accept things for what they are, where they are. You do what you can do. 
Um, you're, we're not engaged in the depressive behaviors. Again, always looking at the doom and gloom of the situation because there are, for everyone that is passed, for everyone that's affected by the coronavirus, we're all very sensitive to all of that. And my heart goes out. I mean, I don't know anyone in my immediate family, hopefully. Um, I know, Stephanie, you have a relative that's been affected. I do, yes. Um, you know, my mother has high school friends that's been affected. So it, the circle seems to get tighter and tighter and tighter. But there are millions of us that are still out here living mm -hmm. and breathing. And we woke up today to do something. Choose something good for yourself first. And then you can then extend that to other people. So no, those five stages of grief, you can Google it, it's out there. Um, if you're part of any you know, sort of groups, things like that, um, take a look at the five stages of grief, decide on where you are today. It may change tomorrow, you may revert back and hopscotch to the next two or three things. You may do something very accepting today and tomorrow be back to bargaining, but just know where you are in that process. And that's really where you wanna start. And I love that because I think we have really, um, we go so much that the forced stopped. And I've shared this on a couple of different webinars. I know with Maxine and I've shared this in my esthetician chat and just said, you know, our way of life has been changed dramatically, um, but our way of business is even more dramatic. And I yeah. think that um, the understanding that business will not ever be the way it was is where a lot of people are trying to not even accept, but really just kind of get their head wrapped around. Um, you know, we have seen people who have um, looked at this as something to really just uh, be focused on. And I've shared this, that I pick and choose when I want to participate in things. That's something that I've learned through all of this is that I don't have to allow the television to throw up on me. I don't have to allow Facebook to tell me how my emotions are going to be. I don't have to let Instagram or a live tell me um, how I'm supposed to be. But I think a lot of us, especially in the spa industry, we're so hurting because we um, miss that relationship with our customers and our clients. And we miss walking into a business that's ours. We miss looking at, you know, our business cards and everything that we've worked for and put together. And, you know, we, we, we miss that, but we also forget that the relationship that our clients have, they're still looking for that. Yeah. And I did this when I went to Maxine's event. My topic was really about being kind of the mean girl where we put our clients in our phone and we keep them there. If they want to have any kind of relationship with us, we really segment that. But the minute they walk into our door, we're like, oh, I missed you. And it's like old friends. But our clients are what's keeping our business open. Yes. And our, again, you could be, you are that person. There are so many clients that we come in contact. And I was always tell my team, when I have my business, you know, you have the client you're supposed to have. And there were so many situations. Um, and of course, clients are in a very vulnerable state when yeah, they're yeah. in your secret room. They're, they're disrobed, they're laying down, you're over them. And as estheticians know, clients will talk to you about all kinds of things. There, we have some limitations because we don't have the physical contact at this point. But again, you still have opportunities to connect with those clients in a very, very real way. And you may be the one person um, that is calling them or contacting them or allowing them to vent, just as you did in that treatment room. It's just going to look a little bit different from this point forward. Absolutely. So for your, for your, I know you have your cost per service. I know you have your productivity worksheet. What are you working on um, in the future that you want to share with everyone? Because I think the transition to... Um, online consultations has really taken the forefront now, along with retail sales. So I know you're working on a, 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 um, a course that will be helping estheticians learn the process of online consultations um, along with product sales. So share a little bit with that and share where people can get it from you and work with you on that because that's where we're going. That's absolutely where we're going. So the uh, platform again, or if you go to Facebook or Instagram, uh, look up Skin Biz School, S-K-I-N-B-I-Z, S-C-H-O-O-L, so Skin Biz School, and you can register on the link there. Um, a lot of people have registered mostly for the cost for service worksheet. It's something that uh, was developed several years ago now, yes. one of the live master classes, and then it just took off. So uh, that is absolutely there. Uh, that product is $25, so not a huge investment, but you 
really do need to understand once you're it made the decision to be a business owner, um, where your money is, um, how you how you're pricing your services, difference between cost and price. So what price you charge is very different from how much it costs for you to deliver that service and pay yourself and cover your your space. So um, it's a really great way to break down services. Um, I re don't recommend that you do the whole menu, although some have, which is great and they're certainly their choice, but recommend that your top two or three services. So you really get a picture for how you're spending money on your back bar products and how you're pricing your services accordingly so that you are and in fact getting paid for that. So that's one product. The weekly productivity worksheet, again, didn't have a lot of interest in that until now. I've opened it up. It will be free uh, probably until that June or July timeframe for those who want it. And um, it's a great way to set your budget up for business ownership or at least see where you are in that process. I am working on a, a course for online consultations. And a lot of the questions we see in forums, questions we've received from our team uh, as, as educators uh, were things like, well, you know, what do you use for the online consultation? How long should it be? How do I incorporate product? So we're gonna talk about all those topics, uh, what options you have to do your online consultation forms. Um, some of us are faced with the harsh reality that we had a lot of customers people who kind of came and went but we didn't have a lot of clients, clients right the loyal ones the ones that come to you for every little thing the ones that uh celebrate your birthday with you and, and you know give you gifts and we know what it is to have true clients right yes. so there are some uh, social media tips in terms of how to build your business within your local area um you gotta decide if you're gonna put yourself out there like that you would be doing that you should have been doing that if you were in business for yourself but Again, some of us like to work off of referrals. So again, there's ways to still build your clientele virtually. Mm -hmm. so and that's where we are. I mean, things. that's where we are. Absolutely. So your, your online consultation forms, how do you incorporate product? How do you upsell product? Um, and the guidelines around a solid online consultation, a virtual consultation platform. So I expect to have that rolled out by next week. And I'll be advertising that to the people who are registered. Uh, first uh, for the first week and then we'll open it up to um, the groups and things like that. That's good. Yeah, no, online consultations are the way to go. Facebook groups are the way to go. Um, you know, WhatsApp group, if, if, if WhatsApp works for you, um, that's the way to go to definitely keep in touch with your clients. You have to keep that relationship there. Um, I know that a lot of estheticians who are doing well, um, as far as their retail sales, a lot of it's coming from Facebook groups because they're doing, one of the challenges that we threw out um, was the uh, detox, the underarm detox, which is transitioning to natural deodorant. We have our illuminating for underarm, our illuminating for bikini. And we're seeing a lot of estheticians now starting to see that people are still wanting to do things at home. Their home care hasn't changed. It's just you and the way they interact with you has changed. And that's one thing that I find um, having to turn the way we do business on a dime, which is what we've had to do. Um, there's people who are open to it and say, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. There's other people who are still in those stages of grief who are still just trying to find their way. And everyone's going to find their way when they find their way. Um, I just really don't want to see um, and it saddens me to see people in these groups who are so just downtrodden um, because it is, it is devastating for some of us. Some of us are really going to have to make very hard decisions. Um, and I would say in the decisions that I've made that have been very hard, looking back on it, it was always for the best. Um, I know, Angela, you and I talked to each other. I talked to you through your closure and your transition and everything else. And during it was horrible. Um, but now that you've looked back on it, it was for the best. And the thing is, I think for both of us, because we've already been through a recession, um, I started Smooth Skin Supply and Save Brazil Wax in the recession. So that started 2008. I was so busy working on that. I didn't even pay attention that we were into a recession. I was so focused on it. Um, but we've been through where we've been restricted, not to this extreme where we're not able to do services, but we've had things that have been uh, decisions that were made for us outside of our control. And I think a lot of it does go back to the control and the accepting of what exactly is happening. I, um, I've had some, some real kind of deep um, truths with some estheticians now just really saying, you know, just because you let go of your space does not mean you're an esthetician. Just because you let go of 
um, what your normal was doesn't mean that you still don't have a business. The way you operate in your mindset always have to be first. And my mindset has really kind of stayed focused because I haven't allowed the extra to come in. Like I don't spend a lot of time in groups. I don't watch the news. I, I've really started to shut off Facebook. You know, I tell you every day I tap out. So about three o'clock my time, everything goes off and I'll just lay and just really, I really uh, am allowing myself to enjoy the time. Yeah. Because when this is all over, we're all going to be running and working and running and, and, you know, seven days a week, some of us to make up for what we lost. And are we mentally ready for that? You and I have talked about what it's going to look like going back to business. And I'm all with the bonnet and the face mask and the goggles and the protective clothes. And, you know, I've, I've seen a few posts and people are starting to refuse. They're saying that they don't want to do this. And I'm starting to see you know, why our business has been labeled as, as non-essential because we, we don't, I believe that people are choosing not to increase their sanitation protocols because of what they believe in. But at this point, with the way that this pandemic has moved, we don't have a choice anymore. We, you know, we don't really have a choice. And ultimately, the consumer will choose. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of businesses across the beauty industry that, um, and I think probably nail care has probably been the one that's kind of led the way. Yeah, I would agree. We take a lot of notes from, from our manicurists because a lot of salons and sal nail salons specifically, um, have thrived because they promote their sanitation procedures. And even that's going to look a lot different. Yeah. Um, again, you want to be taken seriously. You have to get serious. And again, it's, Again, we just still can't believe we're having glove debates in some of these groups, non-negotiable. Um, again, protective gear. And the most important thing, I go back, secure yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I generally will get questions, would you do facials with gloves? Absolutely. Well, how does it feel? Feels great. I feel safe. <laughs> My client feels safe. <laughs> they notice these things, you know. Yeah. But, well, you know, you, you, you're using a lot of sticks. Uh-huh. That's what the service requires. My client notices. And I feel confident in that. So it's, again, no double dipping. Gloves, protective goggles, masks, bonnets, um, protective wear. Like if you go into the doctor, you put that thing on and you tie it up in the back and Velcro it or whatever and you keep things moving. We are coming, let's get real. We're coming in contact with bodily fluids mm -hmm. every day mm -hmm. because we do a lot of waxing and even with skincare. Mm -hmm. So there's, ultimately, I do believe the, the clients and the customers will decide um, because they're trying to go home safe to their families as well. And we should all be doing the same. We should. And, I, I, and I'm, I'm very shocked that this is even a conversation and people are saying, no, I'm not going to. I won't wear a face mask. Okay. Okay. But again, I think people will choose ultimately. The consumers will ultimately choose and then we'll, the choice will be made for us. But again, Companies like Smooth Skin Supply, uh, poised and set to be able to offer more support in those areas and the how and the why. And again, I think this is a, while people, speaking on the downtime, while you have the downtime, um, this is one of the other things I'm working on in terms of an overall coaching program, you really have to establish your esthetician identity. Mm -hmm. Who are you going to be when this is all said and done? What type of esthetician are you? Are you working in more of a clean kind of clinical environment, doing more chemical peels? Are you going to specialize in waxing? Are you going to, um, you know, use more natural products and ingredients? And then that's going to set the course for how you proceed. Because mm -hmm. honestly, if you're doing peels, uh, you should absolutely be using more disposable um, gauzes and you know, instead of using brushes, two by twos, four by fours, two by twos, four by fours, people who are, you know, want to look, do the luxurious mask, what have you, you might use a brush, but then what type of brush are you going to use? Is there an yeah. opportunity for disposable brushes? Somebody might want to take that and run with it, you know, right. or the, the swabs, um, the very large uh, applicators. Yeah, swabs. we still have those. We have quite a bit of those big kind of swabs. So I do too. Right. So disposables. So once you establish your identity as an esthetician, um, and take the time to really do the downtime to really do that. What do you like to surround yourself with when you go into your treatment room? What colors are you choosing? It will dictate everything you do in your business. And I that agree. is what clients connect with. They connect that is. with that service so, provider. Our business is based off a of clientele. Um, and our clients will either decide that we are important or we're not. 
um, at the end of the day. And, you know, yes, they're, they're wanting us now. And yes, they're begging for us now. When they're released, what is it going to look like? And then how are you going to be doing business as well? You know, um, I'm telling my, my mentoring group, you know, start uh, thinking about your sanitation and start recording it so that they know when they come in, there's going to be sanitizer at the door, that they're going to have to put booties over their shoes before they come in. Like, be very open with that. So the expectation and your SOPs, which is standard operating procedures, now reflect that. And if you don't have an SOP, now's the time to work on SOPs. Because that means across the board, your entire way of doing business means that you're going to be doing it in this way. So if that means that clients have to talk to you um, to let you know how their health is before they come in, that's another way. Um, I talked to Catherine Barrell and she was saying now that she's offering people if they feel like they're sick, instead of missing their appointment, then they have an online consultation during that time so that they can still have it. So there's a lot of things that um, can be done where it's not a negative connotation. I'm going to take a, there's a lot of people on Facebook that are chatting. So I'm going to go ahead and go here. Rachel says, I can't believe, um, oh my God, the glove debate makes me cringe. I do my own services with gloves, even though it's me because I don't think twice. I do too. Stephanie, are you selling protective goggles or face masks? We will when we have the stock available. Um, Tiffany Corona says, as a waxing only business, I've been brainstorming on how to make necessary changes for the safety of myself and my clients, which is always important. Um, Bernadette said, yes, our, our county now requires it to have hand sanitizers at the door and sign. Yay. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel says, if people are changing to more disposable, do they also need to reevaluate their cost per service before they reopen? Absolutely. These are things you can start to do now. And I think uh, we should take clues from the essential workers. We're coming in contact with essential workers all the time when we go out. Uh, look at your grocery stores. They're only allowing so many people in at one time. Um, look at your banks. Um, if you're going into the bank for any reason, they have a lot of signage. Um, they're directing people to online resources. Um, they have hand sanitizer at every, every station. So look to the essential workers. Um, you know, hopefully you don't have to go to a hospital or a medical facility for anything, but if you should, take notes of what the essential workers are currently doing. Grocery delivery. They're wearing gloves and taking them off and, and allowing me as a customer to watch them take them off and on. Um, when I had Instacart the other day and the guy came, I, you know, I'm here, I saw him put his mask on, he had it under his neck in the car, he put his mask on, I saw him glove up before getting my groceries out of the car, and then before he left, I, I, I watched him, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he took the gloves off, so, you know, people want to know what you're doing to keep yourself and them safe, record those procedures, um, put a little music to the back, backdrop, and let your customers know when the time comes, these are the things that are going to be expected of you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, having them know that that is going to change and then also giving them a peace of mind. And this definitely takes your business a little bit different so that they understand that you in turn are also protecting them. It's not necessarily also just all about you. It's also in turn protecting them, which people want. They want to feel that way. You know, Rudy up here took his bandana off and then go call me in the store. Where's your bandana? Oh, it didn't feel right. Okay, that's all right. We going you going to get Lysol in your mouth. Keep playing with me. <laughs> Keep playing with me. The thing is is that, you know, we we definitely are going to have to change our SOPs. We're going to have to change our sanitation protocols. And this is without being told. As a collective, we're going to have to take this to another level um, so that people know that we're serious about their health as well. And the thing is is that especially if it's ba your livelihood is based off of your business, why not? You can't afford not to. Um, oh, we have some more on here. Uh, Bernadette says, our state is not allowing bags in stores. They supply disposable bags. Yep. Rachel Gordon says, I feel like the salons and spas will be less of a hangout space or for groups and more of a clinical space where clients get their services done and leave. That's something that I grieve. Yes, you know, the salon and spa, we really love that uh, hangout. I know especially salons because they love being together and that's definitely going to change um, moving forward as well. Uh, do I offer a course on SOPs? Lisa, actually Maxine Drake has an amazing course on SOPs. 
um, that I've been encouraging her to separate out of her main group to offer um, because standard operating procedures are going to change. I believe she's working on something along with sanitation to bring. So keep an eye on that. And I will share that as soon as she has that course available. That is her specialty. SOPs are not my specialty. I know Angela has SOPs that she's done um, in her business. I haven't never uh, in inquired it with um, sanitation, um, but Maxine Drake, and I've heard her speak on SOPs, the way she talks about it, it's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't have that. Oh, I didn't do that either. <laughs> um, so she is going to be working on a, um, a training, a specifically a course on how to do the proper SOPs, even as a sole proprietor, and incorporate your new sanitation protocol. So keep an eye on that space. I will definitely share um, when she has that come available because everyone needs SOPs. From now on, your sanitation, you know, I talked about that the other day, how people were upset keeping logs over their barbicide jars. If you've had the blue stuff in there for two years, then that's, that's why you have the log, which sh again, should be a part of your SOPs, how often you change it, where the logs are kept. You know, a lot of stuff that we know and took for granted when we were in beauty school and how they were teaching us those sanitation protocols. You had your SMA, you had your disposables, your gloves couldn't go on the SMA. Anything that touched the SMA had to go to the garbage. We're going to have to really go back to that basic and take it up like 10 times and be very, very, very consistent with it. And that's the one thing that I think as a group, we should do on our own. This should not have to be told. We shouldn't have to have this pandemic, you know, for people to bear, you know, decide if they're going to do it or not. It should just be this is going to be from now on. Um, and then, you know, we don't know what, what's really going to happen. I mean, to be honest, and I've always said this before, you know, the, the, the coronavirus is, is not the biggest bug out there. Um, there's other viruses in the world. Rudy and I, every night, we're really kind of studying it. And there's like 320,000 known viruses in the world. So this is one. And there's some bigger bugs out there, like some really big, bad bad bugs. But this is an, a, a definitely an opportunity for us to really look at how we can incorporate everything that we're learning, um, everything that's happening, especially like Angela said, with our frontline people um, and our essential workers. This is something that we're going to have to adopt to become our way of life. And the faster we, we understand that that's going to be, the faster we can incorporate it and then also show what we're doing so that we can have that peace of mind with our customers. Cause that's, I'm pretty sure is on their mind. I know for me, I'm like, okay, so what, what, what do I wear? I mean, I know what I'm going to wear out. Are you going to be okay with me walking in with all of my stuff as well? So it's, it's going to be definitely a, a big thing. Bernadette says, I'm wondering if we're going to have to switch to disposable paper sheets instead of linens. Probably. I can see that happening. Um, uh, and if the linens that you do have, you may have to get more linens um, because you'll be washing more uh, if you do decide to keep them. Um, Lisa says, thankfully, we only have one client enter at a time. Our doors are locked for safety. I discourage groups mostly because I'm a germaphobe. <laughs> and that's where we're at now. I mean, everything has been, has been limited. Um, this has been a great, great conversation that we've had. Like I said, you can definitely follow Angela Green. She has a lot of work um, that she's going to be sharing with all of you. If you want to visit, I put the website in our main one here, which is skinbizschool.com. Um, she'll be coming behind and also posting and answering questions at the end of this as well. But this is something that we definitely need to have more discussions about and really understand that, you know, uh, we're waiting for these magic funds to appear. It's going to be a while. Um, we're waiting for the stimulus check. It's going to be a while. We're waiting for unemployment. That's going to be a while. So what are you doing and what can you do right now? Um, and, and half of that has to be definitely from your business and getting that back together. And the other thing has to be money-making activity. You know, uh, a, a lot of us are not in that mindset, but in order for us to even have a little something, we're going to have to really start being focused on money-making activity for our business and for ourselves and our family, no different than when we did in our business. So, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm a straight shooter. Angela's a straight shooter. We've been talking in, in to each other and just saying, you know, a lot of the stuff that people are waiting for, you're waiting, can't be. It has to be action items. You, you have to be doing the work. Yes, they said that it's out there, but I pretend like it's not going to ever be here. So I'm continuing to do the work that I need to do. Because yes, have I applied for the SBA? Yes. Do I have uh, my own uh, number? Yes. Have I done all those things? That's still not a guarantee that you'll, you'll be getting the funding. So 
we have to start acting like the money's not going to come and we have to keep focused and keep moving. And that's, again, going back to Angela's, you know, the, the stages of grief. Some of us are still in denial because we really do think that this unemployment is going to come tomorrow. It's not. That check's going to come tomorrow. It ain't either. And so, when it comes, you know, how much better off will you be if you're still engaging yourself in money making activities? Now, will it make money today? Maybe, maybe it won't. Maybe it will, but, but how much better will you off will you be if you are engaging yourself in at least two to four hours of money making activities? You know, rest of the time you may need to spend with family, spend with yourself, have that downtime. Um, and then again, when that check comes, when those funds do come, you're much better off in the long run. At least you have some things in place. But most importantly, just to wrap, um, most importantly, please know your status. Are you an employee or are you self-employed? And if you can't identify either of those things, this is the time to make that decision and get your affairs in order. If you have to pivot back into being employed by a chain or a hotel or something like that, start to update that resume. Get your things in order and say, I'm gonna do this for a period of time until I can move back into my own business. If you are in that gray area, what do you need to have set up now? It doesn't cost you anything to go online to identify three bookkeeping services in your area and know that when things get better, this is the path that, that I'm on. You can open a checking account online like that. Okay, because here's the truth. For those of you waiting for business funding, they, the banks are absolutely prioritizing people who have accounts with them first. Yes. Um, so again, start today. Don't delay it. And as far as this negotiation with the landlords, absolutely. If you cannot be in that space within the next 30, 60, or 90 days, Give notice. There's nothing keeping you from giving notice if you have a month to month lease. If you have a three month, six month, nine months, one year lease, then you have to negotiate on that basis. But to expect that landlord for you to not pay anything, the lease is the lease, it's still a legally binding contract. Absolutely. Get real. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Courtney says, can anyone recommend a template that's good for proposing adjustments to the rent for a landlord? There are some templates out I've there. I've seen some, yeah. Posted out there. I would Google it. Google um, it for sure. Yeah, and you should find a template uh, with the right verbiage. It's not a lot of information, but it's something that you can basically copy and paste or just type up, write out yourself. And um, But yeah, I would absolutely Google it, and there should be some templates out there. Yes. Yes. That, that's a great question, Courtney. Um, Cause I say, talk to the landlord. You're going to have to have those conversations. Some of you are going to have to put in your 30 day notice and it's okay. It's okay. It will be okay. We have both done it. We're speaking from our own personal experience. We both have to put in, I've done it now twice where I've put in 30 day notices before my lease was up. Um, and it was beyond my control. And I was very honest and just say, I don't have the money to give to you. And I probably won't have it for a while. Yeah. And that's, you know, the Get truth. Your boxes, pack your things. I got my boxes. I packed it up. Um, I even told him I could refer him to other people who may be able to uh, replace it. And he was very grateful for that. And I think one of them actually turned out that it did work. Um, the other one, it was with my doctor and I had had Celine by then and he completely understood. And I just said, I can't drive an hour. Um, but there's, there's times that I have had in business where, like I said, and Angela have said this as, as well, that we've made decisions that we didn't want to make, but it was for the better. There was things that we let go because we had to let go because we had no money to continue. So it's not like you're in this alone. It's not like we've never been through this before. We're sharing both of our experiences that it, it had happened um, and we were okay. And at the time it was miserable, but looking back, it was for the best. Um, and I think that's the thing that a lot of us don't want to, uh, we're going back to those stages of grief. We don't want to really understand that this may be the accepted part. I may have to let my space go. That does not mean that I don't have a business. So please understand that. Um, and, and I know uh, for myself, when I had Smooth Skin Supply and I had my spa, I moved it to my parents' garage so I could keep doing it. Um, I had just a phone in the laundry room answering people's calls. No one knew, but I was working for my parents' home. And I did that for years uh, out in the garage, packing boxes. Um, so, you know, everyone's story is definitely different, but we, we have been there. This is not something that will, will um, you know, it, it's, it's a process that you are going to have to accept 
and then do the things that you may not want to do in order for things to be better when the outcome comes. Because there will be a time where we'll be off of the quarantine. So, you know, instead of telling your folks you miss them and you can't wait to see them, just say, we're happy that you're healthy and, and safe and we're happy that you're at home. And these are the things that you can do you can do at home. Hey, Jack. Jack from London is on. Happy Easter. Thank you. Yeah. Tiffany yeah. said, um, I saved enough for eight months of rent, but it still does not feel right to pay for a space I'm not using. I gave myself to the 15th to have the come to Jesus realization. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. Jack Dunn is joining us. He's from uh, England or London, as he says. He's uh, on the uh, YouTube. I always suggest if you ever want to do male Brazilians that you connect with Jack Dunn and watch him on YouTube. He has some amazing videos. We always love each other when we see each other in person. Um, Tiffany says, I'm okay with that because there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. There's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And thank God you have eight months saved for, for rent. But that doesn't mean you have to give them eight months worth if the business is not open. So please understand that you can give notice, keep that money for you never know what you may need it in the future. And yes, it's hard, but it, it might be for the best. And just know, again, it's, it's something that you're going to have to do. And I, I don't know how are the words to play. Angela, I go back all the time and be like, you know what, this is where, where it's really getting real. Like, this is it. You're going to have to do it. And I remember Angela and I, when we first met, a lot of you guys don't know our story on how we met. Um, I was working for California Skincare Supply at the time. I was a rep for them and Angela had her spa and she was always into her oils. So she could tell you she loved her oils. She loved the oils. <laughs> and I walked in and I was like, um, do you want to really make some money? Because I see the oils are here. Um, like, but do you really want to make money? And Angela, and knowing her now, I crack up about it, but she just looked at me and kind of was like, I said, okay, I will leave my business card here. I get my hair done in front because the beauty salon was in front. She had the spa on the side. I said, I get my hair done every two weeks. I'll come back in about two weeks and let's just have a conversation. She just was like, okay. And I walked out like, okay, well, whatever. And so two weeks, of course, I got my hair done again and I came back in there and I was like, hi, is Angela here? And Angela was like, how can I help you? <laughs> <laughs> and I told her I said are you do you really want to make some money because I see you have your oils here like let's let's start talking about chemical let's start talking about you know some peels let's start doing 30 you know 30 minute lunch peels like I got a great line I can really get you really going really great and she was like Mm -hmm. we're good with our hour treatments I'm like what if you can do and this is the key what if you could do double that and make triple and that's that was the look that she gave me and I said let's have a conversation because look I can help you and from that point on we really got close and it wasn't until I we started talking every Friday we would have every Friday morning we would have our conversations and we would put ourselves on the schedule so on her schedule and on my schedule, we'd have our hour and we just talked. And that was, oh God, how long was that? Oh, was that before I had Celine? Yes. Oh, so we're at what, 15 years? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Good Lord. Yeah, so that's, right. <laughs> that's how we met. And yeah. she wasn't retailing as heavy as she was by the time I got with her. By the time I got done with her, she was ordering the 24s. By the time she got with me, I had my um, three-room um, neighborhood spa, and I had to rent a room from a local salon owner because of the overflow. Okay. I told her, I said, Let, you want to make some money? Let me show yeah. you how to make some money. Yeah. And she and I started doing chemical peels. I was like, oh, this ain't Right. I, I had one loyal client and she was committed to the process, the program, exactly as it was laid out to me. I laid it out to her exactly by script. And I literally watched her skin transform and thought, I can do that. Stephanie that. knew what she, she was talking skin. about. <laughs> what? What? And she told a few friends and they told a few friends. And again, the skincare business, because it was initially when I bought the spot, it was just massage and manicures and pedicures. And we really grew that skincare business to, um, to, to much higher heights. And again, uh, beyond that, even through the valleys, I was still able to find that light at the end of the tunnel. And again, rep for some amazing product lines, increase my knowledge, uh, stay being an esthetician. 
um, again, the travel opportunities, the trade shows, um, the connections, just so much um, from that. So while my time in the spa, um, dealing with clients was amazing and awesome. And I am still in touch with a lot of those clients till today. Some will consult me before they talk to a dermatologist or um, a laser technician for hair removal. Um, what product should I use to recover from this? So it all works hand in hand. Yeah. Do not be afraid to, again, close a door, close a chapter to, to enter a new one. And we're all being kind of forced into that right now, but the resistance is not going to be healthy. It's going to hurt if you surrender and let go to some of the things it just opens you up for more opportunities. Absolutely. Danielle on Facebook says, I would like to continue to retail my products for my clients without visiting the post office daily. Any recommendations? Um, you can actually um, schedule a pickup on the USPS website. Um, I believe it's two weeks out, depending on your post office. Um, you can actually schedule to have your post person pick it up from your house. Um, but you have to check. So it's not for all post offices. And I know the post office is overwhelmed right now. Um, but when I, when we were doing heavy post office before we did FedEx, we would actually schedule it. So they would come every single day outside of delivering our mail. The other thing is, is that you may want to, uh, know your postal person. And, you know, that was the other thing that I did, especially in California, my postal person, I actually would give treats. So we bought him C's candy and he loved, um, the San Francisco Giants. So I really got to know him. I knew where he had lunch because he would hide behind our building and have lunch. Um, he was like, if I'm here having lunch, you can come walking. And, and it was like a block maybe. And I will stay there. I would go to lunch from noon to one and bring me, you can bring the, uh, you can bring the packages. So, you know, definitely know your personal person. If they're the same people on your route, that's a really good thing to do. Um, but check with your post office because sometimes your post office will allow you to schedule a pickup. Um, and that really does, that really does depend on uh, your postal code and your office and how, you know, if they're not inundated or not. So I would definitely uh, look at that. Stamps.com is, is a great one. Um, when I started doing really heavy shipping, I actually would schedule it. It was a little bit better. They actually gave me crates. So all I had to do was come and pick up the crate. Um, and if not, then be thankful that you're able to go to the post office because you're getting money. I mean, sometimes we do things that we don't want to do. Um, and it's not going to be forever. So definitely have a, a long-term plan. And maybe instead of shipping every day, ship every two days remember the post office open six days a week. So three days out of that, you're always shipping. Um, so yeah. And so also there's, check to see if your vendor, where you're getting your skincare products from, is drop shipping. Drop option. Yeah. Um, depending on your volume, they may, you may be able to negotiate. Again, the keyword is negotiate. Depending on how much you're purchasing from them, they may be willing to negotiate that if they're not currently offering a drop ship option. Um, of course, if you have product, you want to try to move that first so that it's just not sitting yeah. Um, but again, if your vendor has a dropship option, that may be something to negotiate with them um, to get the product directly from the warehouse, wherever they are, to that client. Correct. Um, what's an e affordable e-commerce site to open? You know, right now there's a lot of options that you can do. It's just how savvy are you online to work with? So see what's, what resonates with you. Um, there's some that are very complex and then there's some that are very, very simple. Um, say Brazil, we provide a website for you. So our marketing members are doing well because they have their own website already. It's already created. Um, and all they have to do is ship the product. So it's super easy, but you know, there's a lot of e-commerce sites, um, out there. Just really see what Go with the one that gives you the best tutorials that does the step-by-step walkthrough process. That would be what I would suggest. Because um, the, like, the one that I use, which is BigCommerce, is very robust. So there's a lot of options. Um, and I have one person that's just dedicated to doing all of our online stuff. So that's all her job is to do is to make sure that that runs really well. So um, we're at an hour. So Angela, it was always great. We're going to have to come back and have this chat again. I think that a lot of people really found this very, very valuable. Um, you guys can definitely ask us any more questions on this post wherever you are. And then we can definitely go back and answer those questions. Um, but I appreciate your time on this Friday. You guys have a great weekend. And uh, I'll come back to you guys soon with another S and chat. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. So live stream is off. Okay.